Well, folks, I trust that after last night's sermon, you now have a greater appreciation of, of how free we really are as the children of God. As I said last night, to be a true child of God, it really means that we are truly free. And I hope that you can see now that that freedom in its essence is a matter of sonship. And that means that nothing or no one can ever take away our freedom. Our freedom cannot be wrested from us, it cannot be stolen from us, because it is something which has been given to us by God. As we have now, it's a status that we will always have in the future. If we are a Christian, we will always be a free person. That's our status. But today we we turn from the essence of our freedom, as we saw last night, to the exercise of freedom. What do the scriptures say about how we are to exercise our freedom as we live as children of God in this world? And I guess that, that this is the area in which we probably have most questions concerning Christian freedom. What do I have the freedom to do, a child of God? No doubt most of you uh, have been a Christian for long enough to realise that Christians differ on a whole lot of practical issues. There are many practices which some Christians think we are not free to do. And yet, on the other hand, other Christians that we are free to do them. And one of the reasons for this is that in many, many areas of life, the Scriptures do not give us explicit instructions about whether we should do something or not. There are many issues of behaviour that the Bible doesn't deal directly with. And so it comes as no surprise as we look down through the centuries of church history, Christians have held widely differing views about a whole range of practical issues. For example, Christians have differed over what they can legitimately do as part of their record. Can Christians play cards? Can Christians play games of chance which use a dice? Or are they limited to games of skill like chess? Are they allowed to dance? Are they allowed to own a TV? Are they permitted to go to the cinema or to a a football match? What kind of music can Christians uh, listen to? Christians have also differed over what kinds of food they can eat. Can we eat meat? Must we eat vegetables only? Must we refrain from certain kinds of meat like pork or are we free to eat all kinds? Can Christians drink alcohol? Can Christians drink tea? Can Christians drink coffee? Christians have heard about the various outward fashions that a believer may adorn themselves with. Are, Are Christian women allowed to have short hair? Are they allowed to have long hair? Must their hair be covered? Must women, must all women wear dresses? How long must those dresses be? Can they wear pants? May men grow beards? Or must they be clean shaven? Can, how long can a man grow his hair? <laughs> Christians have differed over other things as well. Can they take out a loan and borrow? Can they purchase insurance or must they simply trust God with their property? Well, what jobs or businesses can Christians legitimately be employed in? May, may Christians send their children to a private school or a public school or do all true Christians homeschool their children? Can we go to war? Or may refrain from fighting as soldiers? Now, these are just a sample. <laughs> A very small sample, it seems like a lot, but it's a very small sample of the many, many different areas over which Christians have differed in the past and which Christians still differ today. And each of them are issues about things that the Bible doesn't explicitly give direct commands or prohibitions. They are what we call grey areas. And over the years, for each of these issues, there have been Christians that have said, yes, we are permitted to do these things. On the other hand, Other Christians have said, no, a Christian is not permitted to do these things. Now, I've heard some of those issues, perhaps you're left wondering, well, how can a Christian possibly decide about these things when there are so many areas of behaviour that the Bible doesn't explicitly command or prohibit? What are we to do? What are we to do? Well, at the very least, let me start by saying what you shouldn't do. 
you shouldn't conclude that though just because the Bible doesn't speak directly to a particular issue, you shouldn't conclude that it is insufficient to guide us about the issue altogether. You shouldn't conclude that just because the Bible doesn't have something explicit to say that it has nothing relevant to say about the issue at all. You know the verse, we quoted it last night, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 reminds us that the scriptures are wholly sufficient, wholly sufficient for the man of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for unrighteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work and so although the scriptures may not particularly address a certain issue they provide us with principles biblical principles that will help to inform our course and provide us with wise direction about what we should or shouldn't do on any given issue or behaviour so let's be clear about that right from the very outset The word of God is wholly sufficient to guide us and inform us about the choices that we make even in these grey areas. And so, in this session, I'd like us to look at these broad biblical principles, principles which will help us as individual Christians to make wise decisions about what we should or shouldn't do with our Christian liberty. And that's what I've determined, the individual exercise of our Christian freedom. And the way that I'd like to do that today is simply by asking us a series of questions. They're questions which you can use to help evaluate those grey areas that come up in your life, whatever those areas happen to be. There are seven questions or or seven principles altogether and these, as I said, these seven principles focus primarily on us as individuals. In our next session, we'll deal with an eighth issue, and that has to uh, deal with our, the exercise of our freedom in the context of our relationship with other believers. Today, or in this session, our focus is primarily on ourselves as individuals. And the first question we should ask is this. Have I prayerfully sought God's wisdom on this matter? Have I prayerfully sought wisdom on this matter? It sounds like an obvious question to ask, but how often do we sincerely do that when we are faced with a, a choice that we have to make? All too often we make a snap, uninformed decision that is based upon our own desires or upon the opinions or behaviour of others. J5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Our Heavenly Father promises to give us, His children, the wisdom that we need if we just go to Him and ask for it. After all, truth really comes from Him. And therefore, as His child, we ought to go to our Father in prayer, asking Him to guide us and direct our steps and to show us from His Word the way that is pleasing in His sight. We must ask God's wisdom in prayer. But not only that, we must seek His wisdom in His Word. Go to the very place where God reveals his wisdom to us in his word. As Proverbs 2 verse 6 says, The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Therefore we ought to diligently search the words from his mouth, the word of God, to, to see whether there is that he has actually to say about this issue. For as you study the scriptures, you may find that what you think is a grey area really isn't a grey area after all. You may discover that to your surprise, the Bible does indeed have something very clearly to say about that matter. Therefore, we must seek God's wisdom in his word before we act. And then having done that, it's also wise to seek God's wisdom from other believers. Proverbs 12.15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes but heeds counsel, is wise. See, the foolish man will rush in and say, I have the freedom to do this, I have the freedom to do that, don't go telling me what I should or shouldn't do. But the wise person will often need to seek the advice of of more mature believers, believers who have probably already wrestled with this issue. Their Bible's open. 
and they have come to a particular conclusion. Now, of course, you need to be careful there. You do not go to seek simply the advice of that person. You don't simply go to seek their opinion. What you're looking for are the biblical reasons that undergird their opinion. Now, a fellow believer can be very quick to give you his opinion and tell you, yes, Christians can do this, or no, Christians can't do that. Friends, you mustn't, as we heard last night, you mustn't allow your convictions to be shaped by the opinions of others. The basis for you doing or not, or not doing something should never be, well, it's because so-and-so doesn't do it. Oh, I got that right. I don't do this because so-and-so doesn't do it. I do do it because such-and-such does do it. Your convictions must always be shaped by the Scriptures. And so as you go to seek the counsel of others, what you are seeking is not man's wisdom. You are seeking wisdom and you are looking for the biblical principles that they think undergird their point of view. Don't take their advice if they can't give you the biblical reasons for it. So that's the first uh, biblical principle we must consider. We must prayerfully seek the wisdom of God. Well, let's say that you've done that, that you've prayerfully sought God's wisdom, and yet you're still unsure about whether it is right for a Christian to engage in a certain practice or behaviour. What then? What do you do if you are still not clear about the issue? The second question we need to ask ourselves is this. Do I still have any doubts about the matter? Do I still have any doubts about the matter? Do I know for sure whether this course of action is really pleasing to God or not? Because if you don't, then the Bible has something very clear to say to you and it's found in Romans 14. Please turn with me there in Romans 14. We're going to look at this chapter very closely in the next session. But it's the last part of that chapter that I'd like us to to look at here in connection with this issue, whether we have doubts about something or not. In the Roman church, there were disagreements about, uh, disagreements among the brethren about what kinds of food they could eat. And and there were some who thought they, they could eat meats and some who thought that they couldn't eat meat. And there was a division in the Roman church about this matter. Now know what Paul says in verse 22. He says, Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. Whatever is not from faith is sin. Do you see what Paul's saying here? He's saying, if you Romans have any doubts about whether eating meat is right or not, then don't do it. Don't eat it. For if you eat it when you are not truly that it is the right thing to do before God, then you actually sin. Why? Because you're not acting out of faith. You're not eating meat because you're convinced that God would have you do that. You've actually been pressured into eating it by other people and other circumstances and and that is sinful. See friends, the actual eating of meat, as Paul says in this passage, wasn't sinful in and of itself. In fact, Paul says that Christians were quite free to eat meat. But it became sinful for a person when he ate meat without being entirely sure that it was the right thing to do. So then this is a biblical principle here. If you are not completely convinced that a certain action or behaviour is pleasing to God, then don't do it. Don't do it because, as we see, you actually sin against God by doing something which is doubtful in your own mind. If in doubt, don't do it. That's the second biblical principle. Now again, it may be, after much prayerful study of God's word, you find that the issue really is a grey area after all. Know that the scriptures don't explicitly command it, they don't explicitly prohibit it. And furthermore, you have no doubts about the matter concerned. You're convinced that Christians are free to do that particular practice. It really is a grey area. Let's say you've reached that conclusion. Does that mean you're now free to go ahead and exercise your liberty and do that or not do that? 
Well, not just yet because there are questions you also need to ask. The third question you need to ask before you jump in is, is this practice, is this matter governed by lawful authorities? You see, there are many practices or behaviours which the Scriptures do not explicitly prohibit or require of us, but we are prohibited by those in authority over us. And therefore, we must act in obedience to those authorities. For example, there is no command in Scripture that explicitly says you must have a licence to drive a car, is there? You won't find that in the Scriptures. And if there was no law in this land requiring a person to hold a license for driving a car, then a Christian would be quite at liberty to drive without a license. But the fact is there is a law in this land which requires us to drive with a valid license for we are not free to do what we please in this matter, even though the scriptures are silent on the issue. In Romans 13, if you flick back a a couple of chapters or one chapter to Romans 13, Paul deals directly with this issue. Notice what he says, Romans 13, the first two verses. Let every subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So, friends, the scriptures may be silent about a matter, but if that matter is governed by those in authority over us, then we are not at liberty to disobey them, unless, of course, it is contrary to the scriptures. But if we do disobey them, we actually resist God and we bring judgment upon ourselves. We resist God because we... Uh, resist the command that he has given us in his word concerning lawful authorities. So that's the third principle. In grey areas you must still obey an authority over you. Right, we're starting to, to narrow it down. And let's assume that we've got all the bases covered so far. We've ter- determined that this matter really is a grey issue. We've got no doubts about whether we should do it or not. The authorities that have nothing to say about the matter, are we now free to go ahead and exercise our liberty? Still, no, not yet. <laughs> there are more principles to uh, consider. And the fourth one is this. The fourth question we need to ask ourselves is this. Hinder my personal sanctification. Will it hinder my personal sanctification? Will it stifle my growth in holiness? And to see what I mean by that, turn back to that passage which Daniel read earlier this morning, Hebrews 12. Hebrews 1. Notice carefully what the author of Hebrews says here. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know the passage. But it's that middle part of verse 1 I want us to look at particularly. Notice what we are commanded to lay aside. We are to lay aside every weight or every encumbrance as some versions put it, and the sin which so easily entangles. You see, in this Christian race, this Christian pursuit of godliness and holiness, we are not just to lay aside every sin, but we are also to lay aside every weight. Do you see that there? See, there's a difference. See, friends, this passage teaches us that there are things other than sin which will hinder our pursuit of Christ-likeness. There are things which are not necessarily sinful in themselves, things indeed which we may have the liberty in Christ to do, but nevertheless, they still burden us and weigh us down as we seek to run the race that is set before us. And therefore, we need to lay them aside. 
Apostle Paul put this exact same truth in, in, over in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12. He said, There all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. As other translations put it, all things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. In other words, there are many, many things that I may have the liberty to do as a believer. All of these things will edify and help to build me up in Christ's likeness. Some legitimate practices may only serve to stir up the flesh and inflame sinful desires. Some things may hinder your ability to resist temptation. Some things may dampen your zeal for Christ and increase your love for them. And as individual believers, we need to know what each of these weights are so that we can identify them and lay them aside. Take a modern example. Well, before we do that, I want to make a point. The weight or burden that we lay aside, the thing that may be a weight for us, may not be a weight for your brother and sister. The very thing that hinders you in your spiritual growth may actually be the very thing that helps your brother and sister in his spiritual growth. It's not a weight for him. So think about the internet, for example. One believer may realise that his time on the internet only hinders his spiritual growth. It may present him with temptations that he struggles to resist or it may consume so much of his time that he just doesn't have time for his other duties. And so he decides this thing is a me. It's a weight. I need to lay it aside if I'm ever going to make real progress in holiness. And, and so he cuts it off. He does what our Lord said in Matthew 5 verse 30 when he said, if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. He disconnects his computer from the internet and he finds that it, he is now made great strides in his pursuit of holiness. But another believer may find that the internet is actually a great help for him spiritually. It provides him with access to helpful writings from the past. It allows him to hear great biblical preachers that teach him from the scriptures and about the Christian life. And he finds that the internet very helpful in, making him, in helping him to make great strides after Christ's likeness. So you see then how what may be a weight for us as individuals what may be a hindrance to us as individuals may actually be a help and blessing to our brother. And therefore, friends, what you must never do, what you must never do when you find that there are certain practices that you have to lay aside, what you must never do is make your own actions the measure of godliness and Christian maturity for your brother and sister. You must never insist that believers should do the same thing that you have to do in order to grow in holiness. Because it's not true. You don't set the standards of Christian liberty for others. So don't rob your brother of, what, of that which is a legitimate uh, exercise of his liberty for him. As one preacher put it, and he put it this way, and I won't get it, I don't think. He, he said, the only hand that new covenant believers are commanded to cut off is their own. We're not to go around cutting off the hands of our fellow believers in the hope of making them more holy. What I succeed in doing is making them a spiritual cripple. See my point? There are many legitimate practices and activities that Christians have the liberty to engage in. Some will help you personally and some will hinder you. And we each have the responsibility of what the activities are which hinder our own personal growth in holiness. Just because you have the liberty to do something doesn't mean that it will help you spiritually. And if it doesn't, you personally need to cast it aside. That's the fourth principle. We must lay aside every practice that hinders our spiritual walk. There's a fifth question and it's very closely related to that last one and it's this does this practice or practice control me does this practice bring me into bondage Paul also makes his point in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 if you're still in that chapter or if you turn to there before after he says all things are lawful for me but all things are not helpful 
he goes on to say all lawful for me but I will not be brought under the power of any you see there are particular practices or behaviours which are likely to be habit forming there are some things that although we have the liberty in Christ to do they actually become addictions that we find hard to break and they become essentially another hindrance in our growth and pursuit of holiness they consume our time they consume our money they consume our thoughts they consume our desires they constantly take you away from your other duties and responsibilities as a believer those you to constant temptations to sin which you find hard to resist they are controlling you and you need to lay those things aside just like every other weight you see if anything has control over you if a certain practice or habit is something that you've become addicted to and guess what you're no longer free to do it you've actually lost your freedom in that particular area of your life because you have become a slave to an addictive habit it's brought you into bondage and you need to cut yourself off that enslaving practice Friends, having said that, remember again that same practice which has gotten control over you may pose no problem for a fellow believer. believer. The things which enslave you may not enslave others. And therefore, we must again never insist that the thing which controls us is sinful for another believer. We must look to our own individual walk before God and refrain from every practice that enslaves me enslaves you that's the fifth principle we must lay aside every practice that controls us or brings us under its power sixth question we need to ask does it hinder of the gospel does it hinder, does this practice, does this legitimate Christian liberty hinder the spread of the gospel? In other words, will this particular practice or behaviour cause unbelievers to actually reject the gospel of Christ? To illustrate, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. In this chapter... Paul is defending his right, the right that he had to do certain things as an apostle of Christ. But in particular, he's on the right that he has to be paid for his work as an apostle. He defends his right to refrain from secular work, we might say. He says he has the right to be supported in his labours by the financial contributions of his fellow believers. In other words, he's defending his right to be patron of the gospel. Notice what he says, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 3 to 7. My defence to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of that flock. And then in verse 8, he goes on to make a biblical case for his right from the Old Testament that he really does have the to be paid as a preacher of the gospel. But notice what he says in verse 12 now. Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ you see in that particular place in that particular and in those circumstances Paul knew that for him to receive payment for his preaching labours would only serve to hinder the gospel of Christ it would give others an opportunity to say to other people to point at Paul and say look look, he's obviously only in this for the money don't listen to him don't pay attention to anything that this greedy man has to say so because Paul did not want anything he did to cause others to reject the gospel, he didn't exercise what was for him a legitimate right. 
He didn't do what he was perfectly entitled to do. And something that he had complete freedom to do before God. He refrained from exercising his liberty so that the gospel would not be hindered. Indeed, look at what he goes on to say in verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made for servant to all that I might win the more. To the Jew, I became as a Jew to win them. To the Gentile, essentially, without the law, he says, I became as a Gentile. To the weak, I became as one weak. And then he sums up his policy in verse 22. I've become all things to all men that I by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake. Friends, whatever you do, don't misunderstand what Paul is saying here in this context. For these verses are frequently yanked out of their context by many Christians who see them as a proof text that allows them to engage in all kinds of questionable behaviour in an attempt to win others for Christ. You know the attitude. Paul said, I've become all things to all men and therefore I'm free to go and have a beer at the pub or free to hold a local a church service at a local pub in order to win beer for Christ. We've got to become like the world if we're ever going to win the world. We've got to do what the world does in order to win them to Christ or else they won't hear us. I'm sure you've heard that kind of reasoning before. My friends, notice that this whole passage, look at the context. Notice this whole passage is Paul exercising his liberties. It's not about him engaging in or doing various things he wouldn't normally do to save souls. It's actually about him refraining. Refraining from legitimate practice which others might find and which might cause them to close their ears to the gospel. Paul is actually saying here that he gives up certain things in order to win others for Christ. And so we must do the same ourselves. We need to ask ourselves when any legitimate practice, any grey area, will this practice, will this activity that I plan to engage in, will this legitimate behaviour actually prevent unbelievers from hearing the gospel message, from receiving the good news of Christ? Now, admittedly, you do say that the gospel is a stumbling block for unbelievers. It is an aroma of death unto death for those who are perishing. But friends, we certainly don't want to make the gospel to stink unnecessarily. We don't want to make it stink unnecessarily by engaging in legitimate prayers which offend the unconverted. That's the sixth principle. When it comes to exercising our individual Christian liberty, we must do nothing that will unnecessarily hinder the reception of the gospel. The seventh and last question that we need to ask ourselves when it comes to exercising our Christian freedom is this one. Can I glorify God in this matter? Can I glorify God in this matter? Will doing actually bring glory to God or will it bring shame upon his name? You know the passage that I'm going to quote, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know that verse. But do you realise this, friend? that this verse is actually in the context of a passage which speaks about the exercise of Christian freedom. You look at the context. Paul has just finished saying that if you know that your brother has an issue, which in this case was the issue of eating certain meats, then don't you go and do it in front of him. You may have to do it, but don't tempt him to eat it and violate his own conscience. God's not glorified when you give thanks for a meal and scoff it down in front of a brother who actually thinks your actions are sinful. And so, therefore, Paul says, he comes to verse 31, therefore act in a way which brings glory to God. Whatever you do, that's the overall flow of the passage. It's in the context of Christian freedom. Well, look at 
as I said before, we'll look at this issue of Christian freedom in relation to our fellow brothers and sisters in the next session. But for now, let's just grasp the principle that Paul says here. We must exercise our Christian freedom that brings glory to God. And so when you are about to engage in a certain activity, can you honestly give thanks to God for what you're about to do? Will your actions bring honour to your Father's name? Or will your behaviour as last night cause his character and his reputation to be marred in the eyes of others? Remember, you are about to act as a son. You are about to act as the son of the Heavenly Father. And what what you will do may harm the reputation of your family's name and of the reputation of your father's name. So we need to ask ourselves a question. Will it bring glory to my heavenly Father? That's the seventh principle. Our practices, the exercise of our Christian liberty must glorify our Father and His name. I hope you can see, friends, that as we've gone through these biblical principles, that this matter of Christian liberty is not as simple as it may appear on the surface. The right exercise of our individual Christian liberty involves more than finding out whether the Bible prohibits or commands a certain practice or not. There are other principles that we need to consider too. And let me just list them for you again. Here are the questions, if you didn't get them the first time. Have I prayerfully sought God's wisdom on this matter? Do I doubts about this issue? Is it an area governed by lawful authorities? Will it hinder my personal sanctification? Will it control me? Will it hinder the reception of the gospel? And finally, will it glorify Heavenly Father? And if the answers to any of those questions means that you have to refrain from exercising your freedom in a certain matter, then that's what you should choose to do. realize as I said last night I'll say it again that by refraining from an otherwise legitimate practice your status as a free man doesn't change you are still a free man even if you choose not to exercise your freedom you haven't lost your liberty in the slightest you remain gloriously free in fact by choosing to refrain in certain circumstantially demonstrate just how free you are after all For it's only the free man who can choose whether or not to exercise his freedom. So may God then help each of us to exercise our freedom wisely in ways that help our sanctification, that aid the spread of the gospel and ultimately bring glory to the one who is our loving Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Our Father, we and we acknowledge once again that you have been very kind to us in giving us your word, in giving us the scriptures, and we recognize again, Lord, that they are wholly sufficient to direct us and guide us even in matters which they do not explicitly command or prohibit. We pray that you would teach us more deeply these biblical principles, that you would give us the courage to exercise and implement those principles in our own life. That when it comes to a grey area, we stop and consider whether we have indeed fulfilled these biblical principles. Lord, again, we need your help. We need the help of your spirit. And we pray once again that you would make us, make us sons who you love to glorify the Heavenly Father. Make us sons who love to live in a way that is the family name. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.